a child, there were a variety of remedies that my mother used in the house and made to deal with sickness. And I'm sure this is a theme that is relatable to most in that there are lots of different remedies for general sickness that are used by mothers and parents in the home or what some might call home remedy. As far as my mother goes, the primary home remedy was always to be garlic, raw garlic cloves mixed with honey. And naturally the garlic would be chopped or ground up into the honey to be mixed together into a sort of digestible paste. The honey was necessary to help with digestion because garlic does not sit very well in the stomach and if you eat garlic straight then you'll learn very quickly that it's best to sit down rather than stand up. Otherwise it will not stay in the stomach. Whereas the and the garlic of course helps to boost a person's natural immune system. Now many are probably aware that chamomile tea is equally beneficial of a substance during times of sickness. But one thing that I was unfamiliar with in the past is that it is, makes for very good addition to bath water and that it can help reduce a lot of irritating infections and other problems that might appear in the sensitive areas. So chamomile is extremely useful in many varieties but is most mostly attributed to liquid intake. Of course tinctures and salves and all sorts of other different products have harnessed varieties of natural remedies and made them into usable products and there are volumes written about the subject. There are many varieties and many different things that are useful. Among those products the ashwagandha plant is recognized as a very useful substance for a variety of things. One of those of course being anxiety. And if you look up the safety of ashwagandha, the drug cartel paid propagandists will have to admit one thing. And that is, according to them, under the article, is ashwagandha safe? It states, ashwagandha is generally safe for most people with high quality supplement, with a high quality supplement. Of course, I'm sure that they know what high quality is, meaning controlled and taxed and, and modified by them and when it is used at responsible doses and of course they know what responsible doses are and those are likely things that wouldn't impact their other operations in the health sphere and it continues to state that in some cases combining ashwagandha with other substances like certain prescription or over-the-counter drugs may cause them to be ineffective and could be unsafe and so there you go ashwagandha they don't like it, and the reason is because it negates the effects of drugs, of the substances that they make and control with the intent to not only cause damage, but to cause symptoms and issues that will give them the ability to continue management of such particles. And this leads into another substance, which is called Kratom, or Kratom, or there's many different ways that people refer to this particular plant, which is usually processed and sold in powder or a tablet form. But one of the primary things that Ashwagandha or that Kratom does is that it combats heroin withdrawal, or at least it is reported to do that. This obviously would present a major issue, especially when it comes to the primary control mechanism, which is the awful withdrawal symptoms of heroin use. And that would it make an impact on the control mechanism around the prostitution industry, shall we call it, and the homelessness industry. 
And naturally, if these people, that many of them controlled by heroin withdrawal symptoms, if they were to gain a product that could alleviate that, that would instantly remove a very impactful and effective spy network, which is clearly one of the major reasons behind the so-called homelessness and prostitution crises, which are very, very effective at gathering information and all, all sorts of other things. They're just, they can be very useful and naturally you would have most outlets that control these spheres not wanting that to be impacted. And so this presents a very plausible, logical motive for the reaction of the, what you might refer to as a crackdown on Kratom. Under the PBS NewsHour article by Ike Sweatlitz, or Sweatlitz, it states HSS recommended that the DEA make Kratom a Schedule One drug like LSD or heroin. Now, why on earth would they do that? So let's read further. This was dated November 10th, 2018. It states, Washington, the Department of Health and Human Services has recommended a ban on the chemicals in Kratom that would make the popular herbal supplement as illegal as heroin or LSD, according to documents obtained by STAT. HSS or HHS asserted in a letter to the Drug Enforcement Administration that two chemicals in Kratom should be classified as Schedule One substances, meaning that the chemicals have a high potential for abuse and that there is no currently accepted medical use for them. The letter was accompanied by supported analysis. Now notice that they're stating that they want two things in Kratom to be registered, and so they're not technically stating that they want Kratom to be registered, even though that's pretty much the, uh, the motive here. In continuation, should the DEA make such a ruling, anyone who buys, sells, or uses the substances might face steep punishments like prison sentences, and anyone who wants to do research with chemicals would need to obtain special permission from the DEA. Specific penalties would depend on state and federal laws. Those aren't laws, mind you. They're operating under the color of law, but those aren't laws. That are often related to the permission from the DEA um, that are often related to the DEA's scheduled decisions. So possession of Kratom might be treated differently than LSD, for example. In interviews with STAT, several scientists expressed concerns that such a ban would stifle research on chemicals that could be developed into alternatives to the addictive prescription opioids that kill tens of thousands of Americans each year. They said banning Kratom would harm people who are currently using the substance. Yeah, I highly doubt that. I'm sure the only reason why anyone who is a so-called scientist would want to keep Kratom from being banned is simply for regulatory purposes of controlling it so that only they are allowed to synthesize things out of it and thus they can keep control over their homeless and prostitution populations by making alternatives to alleviate the symptoms of heroin withdrawal uh, basically prohibitive by taxing it to no end and putting ridiculous regulations on it that pull, pulls it out of the hands of the so-called common public person. So, in continuation, people have been using Kratom, a plant from Southeast Asia, to treat pain and other conditions and to wean off opioids. It is not approved by the Food and Drug Administration, no surprise there, and that agency has led an aggressive crackdown on the plant, halting some imports and reprimanding companies for claiming that the substance has medical benefits. The recommendation in the document is keeping, in keeping with past public statements from leading federal officials, including FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb. Notice that last name there, Gottlieb. I highly doubt that the there is any accident that the FDA, FDA Commissioner mentioned here, and mind you, FDA is Food, Drug, and uh, Food and Drug Administration, I highly doubt that there is any accident that he bears the same last name, and if you look at them, the two people together, you'll notice they look very similar, to a certain scientist that worked for the CIA on so-called Project MKUltra, 
which was a CIA drug mind control, drug-induced mind control program, and Sidney Gottlieb was the main, one of the main scientists that worked in that sphere, and naturally you have a person who is, again, in the Food and Drug Administration who bears the same last name. That cannot be an accident. So, in continuation, but it is the first indication of the agency's position on scheduling the chemicals in Kratom, I mean scheduling Kratom itself. Gottlieb, he said that Kratom is an opioid and has been associated with dozens of deaths. Yeah. Okay. Associated with dozens of deaths. Haha. <laughs> yeah, okay. There's double speak for you. Kratom should not be used to treat medical conditions, nor should it be used as an alternative to prescription opioids. Well, naturally, because they want to control how people act using drugs, mind control with drugs, you know, just like Sidney Gottlieb. Gottlieb said in a statement in February, he added, there is no evidence to indicate that Kratom is safe or effective for any medical use. Yeah, no evidence, huh? Uh, I wonder who that person is that has no evidence, and I wonder why there is no evidence, perhaps because a certain family of Gottliebs decided to eradicate any evidence to the contrary and any evidence that would cause issues for their mind control with drugs. Now it's up to the DA to decide whether or not the chemicals should be placed on Schedule 1. DA spokesperson Catherine Pfaff declined to say when this might happen and said the process can take months to years. Members of the public would have some time to appeal the decision or make comments before the decision is finalized. Yeah, what a, what a crock. The medical and scientific evaluation that HHS provides to, D, to, well, to DEA, to the, the DEA, is a crucial document in the process, Pfaff said. DEA spokesperson Rusty Rick Payne declined to say whether the agency typically follows HHS recommendations like the one in the document stat obtained. He said it would take days to pull those and yeah, blah, blah, blah. Just more nonsense of them pretending to have authority besides the barrel of a gun. Scientists and Kratom advocates, yeah, I highly doubt scientists are actually involved, warn that banning Kratom outright will only harm people, especially people who are using Kratom instead of stronger painkillers. I have major concerns about just pulling the rug out from under tens of thousands of people. Yeah, I'm sure there are tens of thousands, perhaps not more than that, who are using this to support their health, especially in the case of people who are using it to staff more dangerous opioids, said Andrew Krugel, a Columbia University associate research scientist in chemistry who has studied Kratom. The Washington-based group that opposes a Kratom ban, the Drug Policy Alliance, paid to fly Google to D.C. twice this year to discuss the issue with Congress, he said. Some states have already banned Kratom, but it is currently legal at the federal level. It's sold in different forms, including dry powder and capsules. According to the American Kratom Association, millions of Americans use the substance. Pete Kenlin, executive director of the association said this is the organization's best estimate but did not provide a specific source. The federal government has been contemplating tougher regulation for years. In 2016 the DEA tried to ban the chemicals in Kratom but reversed course after several severe backlash from Kratom users and members of Congress. The DEA then solicited the advice of the FDA on how to proceed. Staff obtained the document through a Freedom of Information Act requested request sent in March to the DA, the DA routed the request to HHS. HHS provided a document that appears to be missing some pages, but includes the de de department's recommendation. Yeah, that's not a surprise there. It's called covering their butts, because they're constantly involved in a highly suspicious and wicked operations at the so-called benefit of the national security, whatever that means. An HHS spokesperson declined to provide the complete document and said that the original document was provided to stat in error. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Can't imagine what other suspicious and nefarious activities somebody with the last name Gottlieb is involved in. <laughs> 
This document was inadvertently disclosed and should have been withheld, as it is part of a pre-decisional deliberative process rightfully protected by the Freedom of Information Act and implementing regulations, said HHS spokesperson Caitlin Oakley. Yeah, they don't like people when they interfere in their destructive operations against the human American public. Not the juridic public, of course, because the juridic public can't necessarily be poisoned unless you poison the humans that work in the juridic entity, but that's a whole other subject. In continuation, that deliberative process is still going on, and therefore we have nothing further to add. In the le letter dated October 17, 2017, HHS sent some recommendation, which according to the letter is supported by the FDA as well as the National Institute on Drug Abuse at the National Institutes of Health. The recommendation put the chemicals in Kratom on Schedule 1, so of course they did it. What a surprise. Not only would the move make it illegal to buy, sell, or use the substances, but it would also make it more difficult for researchers to study Kratom. Yeah, that's... I already mentioned that. That's just uh, the articles repeating the same thing that it said before. And, of course, you can read further into this article if you so desire. But there's very little in the article that is useful beyond what was already mentioned. Now we get into an article from the Food and Drug Administration itself talking about specific measures that were actually taken to shut down the threat that Kratom posed to their elaborate control network of uh, drug addiction through opioids and heroin using the horrible withdrawal symptoms as their primary control mechanism, which is clearly a, a outcome of Operation MKUltra. It states, the U.S. F Food and Drug Administration announced today that U.S. Marshals, at the agency's request, seized nearly 90,000 bottles of dietary supplements labeled as containing Kratom. The product, manufactured for and held by Dordonis, Dordonis Natural Products LLC, located in South Belo, Illinois, is marketed under the brand name Relux Pro and worth more than 400000 Quote, we have identified Kratom as a botanical substance that could pose a risk to public health and have the potential for abuse. Now, I imagine in that sentence, to uh, decipher it a little bit, the public health they're talking about is the juridic public. So it would be the health of juridic entities. Because a lot of juridic entities, especially the drug cartel kind, they depend on the control through drug use and through people's abuse of drugs. They depend on that for their own existence. And so it would damage the juridic public's health if the human public that was part of those juridic entities were to take things that damage the control of that juridic entity, thus making the juridic entity non-existent. So that is clearly a double speak there where he's saying something that we think he's saying one thing, but he's actually saying something else. But in continuation, said Melinda Placer, Placier, okay, so it would have been a she that was saying it, the FDA's Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs. The FDA will continue to exercise our full authority under law. Yeah, they have no authority under any laws. They have regulatory authority th through the threat of force and death and destruction. That's that's the law they have. That's the the law of conquest, I suppose, through fraud and threats and stuff. To take action on these new dietary ingredients, especially if they ignore the notification requirements, as part of our commitment to protecting the health of the American people. Now, those are the juridic people. Those are not the human people. So, my my tragina speciosa, commonly known as kratom, is a botanical substance that grows naturally in Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea. Serious concerns exist regarding the toxicity of kratom in multiple organ systems. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's what the serious concerns are regarding. Consumption of kratom can lead to a number of health impacts, including, among others, respiratory depression, vomiting, nervousness, weight loss, and constipation. Yeah, those sounds uh, sound a lot like the withdrawal symptoms of heroin to me. Which you can look those up. Kratom has been indicated to have both narcotic and stimulant-like effects, and withdrawal symptoms may include 
hostility, aggression, excessive tearing, aching of muscles, and bones and jerky limb movements. February 2014, the FDA issued an import alert that allows U.S. officials to detain imported dietary supplements and bulk dietary ingredients that are or contain croton without physical examination. Yeah, that's no surprise there. They really don't want this thing threatening their control over the homeless and prostitution populace. In January, and others, of course. In January 2016, the FDA administratively detained Relix Pro under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act as amended by the Food Safety Modernization Act, FSMA, under its administrative detention authority. The FDA can detain a food or dietary supplement product if the agency has reason to believe the product is adulterated, adulterated, adulterated or misbranded. And of course that authority comes from the barrel of gun. Now, not any legitimate authority or any lawful because lawful presence because this entity, the Food and Drug Administration, has no constitutional authority. They have no legitimate authority to operate or exist within the territorial bounds of the United States. Any place that states that it is following the Constitution of the United States, well, if they're either following a name or they're following it in reality. If they're following it in reality, then the FDA cannot exist because they have absolutely no legitimate authority in the United States to operate. Anyway, the agency can keep detained products out of the marketplace for a maximum of 30 days when it determines whether to take further enforcement action, such as seizure. The U.S. Department of Justice, on behalf of the FDA, filed a complaint in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Illinois, alleging, among other things, that Kratom is a new dietary ingredient for which there is inadequate information to provide reasonable assurance that it does not present a significant or unreasonable risk of illness or injury. Therefore, dietary supplements containing Kratom are adulterated under the FD&C Act. Yeah, that of course would be the illness or injury to the juridic people that they have been talking about, pretending to talk about human people. The FDA is warning consumers not to use any products labeled as containing Kratom. Healthcare professionals and consumers should report any adverse events related to products containing Kratom to the... Yeah, who gives a crap? The uh, FDA, an agency within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, protects the public health, juridic public, by assuring the safety, effectiveness, and security of human and veterinary drugs, vaccines, and other biological products for human use. See, now notice that. They, they stipulate the difference between a person and a human. They know what they're talking about. These people are not sick in the head. They're not messed up. They are simply wicked and evil, and they are enemies of the Constitution and all of the people of the United States and perhaps the globe. They are just wicked individuals that do things on behalf of juridic entities. The FDA, an agency within the U.S. Department... Oh, well, I already read that. And in another article, dated August 4, 2016, Kratom seized in California by U.S. Marshals Service. The U.S. F Food and Drug Administration announced today that the U.S. Marshals Service seized more than 100 cases of products labeled as containing Kratom. The products are distributed by Nature Therapeutics LLC, which does business as Kratom Therapy and is located in Grover Beach, California. The seized products are marketed under the brand name Kratom Therapy and are worth approximately $150,000. U.S. Department of Justice filed the complaint on behalf of the FDA in the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California, alleging that the seized Kratom products are unapproved new drugs and misbranded drugs in the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So here you get a repetition of essentially the same structure, so it's almost like a copy and paste, and these articles are probably written by the same person, but they clearly are different events happening in different parts of the country. The FDA will continue to take aggressive enforcement action to safeguard the public from harmful drug products illegally marketed as treatments for which they have not been studied or approved, said Melinda Placer, the FDA's Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs. Yeah, again, that's the same thing that she allegedly said before. So this article is, is um, repeating essentially the same stuff, but one article is talking about the event that happened in Illinois while the other happened in California, and they're suspiciously similar. This is clearly an operation of a small group of individuals that are acting as agents of the juridic entity, the Food and Drug Administration of the juridic entity, the Department or the uh, Health and Human Services juridic entity, and all of the other corporate juridic entities that rule over the 
humans and regulate human use of things. Now, when it comes to that product that shall not be named, the particularly vicious and villainous product that has attempted to have been forced on everyone, at least all those of human origin, well, it bears a striking resemblance to a certain practice of pincushion voodoo dolls. So there we get a correlation to the past and that these tactics and these mechanisms are not new, they have been replicated and the presence and themes of such things can be found all over the place. So the pincushion voodoo dolls, which usually have the effect of desiring the death or destruction or sickness or something other of other people, well, that's quite similar to a certain needle of substances that shall not be named making humans into pincushion. And actually, this all has to do with the concept of regulating and managing illness, sickness, and disease versus the concept of uh, removing or erasing or preventing disease, sickness, and illness in the first place. Doctors and so-called medical professionals and regulators simply seek to regulate or administrate or manage health. They don't seek to have good health. They don't seek to have preventative uh, disease or sickness. They don't seek to remove any of that stuff. And so the opposite perspective can be found in Dead Doctors Don't Lie, a highly censored subject by Dr. Joe Wallach. And this talks about the uh, concept of preventative measures and the ability to remove and eliminate sickness and disease altogether, which would be a major problem, obviously, for the drug cartel controllers who profit, but most importantly, control the world using such substances. Now, from my own personal experience, I have many stories that I could share, but I'll focus on when I was in the Marine Corps and some of the specific ones that relate to this topic, such as my, I cut my ear on something called concertina wire. Concertina wire, also known as sea wire, is a particular defense for military installations that is similar to barbed wire but much more potent and effective than barbed wire. But it is often mixed with barbed wire together in conjunction and concertina wire is a um, pretty nasty substance. But anyway, I ended up cutting my ear on it and that was when I was putting it up. And so the corpsman came over and said that I needed to go to the, to the uh, medical room and I said no I'd rather stay because it's not really a big deal and all I have to do is put a bandage on it and nothing else like that so it was a whole big deal and, and whatnot but anyway it was mentioned the whole concept that comes into play in this field of our human lives and that is the fact that if I didn't if he had told me to go to the emergency room and considering his job as a corpsman was to be responsible for those in the unit that he was attached to, and I decided that I refused to go, well then that would be quote unquote disobeying a direct order, and I could get a lot of trouble, and a lot of trouble for doing that despite the fact that I personally do not trust, and will never trust, anybody who wears a white lab coat, has a title, or does anything that possibly might have a monetary motive behind it, and all these other things that we find in the current so-called medical industry. So, yeah, no, I, I would definitely not go to them for a problem that I know would be only be made worse. So, it came down to the fact that uh, that if, if the situation got worse, then I would have to go, but they didn't make me go. But either way, that whole idea of disobeying a direct order is them, they can order you to do something that you know is destructive and damaging. Essentially, they could order everyone in the Marine Corps or the military to go and voluntarily submit themselves to execution via medical means, and if you didn't do it, then you were disobeyed a direct order, and they'd probably make you do it anyway. So that's the state of affairs, and that's why it's no surprise that all the things that happened in 2020 happened, because that's the way they see people. Their entire job is to retain the good health of the juridic public, 
and that requires maintaining control over the health of the human public. And this, of course, comes from the same people that decided they were going to operate on my teeth while I was in boot camp to do an unnecessary root canal without painkillers, and they left my mouth a bleeding mess, which that was very nice of them. But I can only imagine all the other experiments and tests and other things that they performed on me while I was in the captive position of being in the military and swearing an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution while they were obviously breaking it in so many different ways. And of course, while I was in boot camp, they also gave me 15 back over a period of two days, which when I joined originally in the Marine Corps, when I went to boot camp, I had had no vaccines in my entire life. And so they decided to try to give me all of them over two days, and they turned me into essentially a uh, walking walking dead. Everybody said I looked kind of like a, a corpse, or I looked like a, a Holocaust victim mixed with a heroin addict, and my skin had turned yellow, and I just looked like death. And that's essentially what they did, and what they do with vaccines. It's all about causing sickness to maintain health, essentially. And this is no new perspective, as we'll find in the Levantine Adventure by the Travels and Missions of Chevalier Darvu, 1653 to 1697, by Ward H. Lewis. On page 46, it states under chapter 3 1657 was a sickly year in Smyrna, and during it, Darvu fell dangerously ill with a phlegm on the chest a disease which was ravaging the foreign community. One suspects too that he was beginning to show signs of wear and tear after four years of Smyrna life, for when the doctor examined him, he forbade him to drink brandy. Whereupon Darvu, being the kind of man he was, immediately put himself on a regimen of burnt brandy and sugar and claimed that his own treatment had cured him. I attended, he says, complacently, the funerals of several, several of those who had been fools enough to follow the doctor's advice. But however that may have been, I have the feeling that the firm of Bertandie had come to the conclusion that a tour of duty in a less hectic shell than Smyrna would do Darvu no harm, for at the end of the year he was ordered to seed with Bertandie Jr., who would become the company's agent at the port. We are not told who arranged the itinerary, but I suspect that it was Darvu. It would have been like him to convince his employer that the only practical route from Smyrna to Seed was to travel south to Egypt, transship there, and then travel northwest to Palestine. In any case, that is what they did, embarking on an English vessel in February 8, 1658. Now this subject is continued in another book written by the same author, Warren H. Lewis, titled The Splendid Century Life in the France of Louis XIV. Rather to the irritation of Charles, who asks, Does it need so many ignoramuses to kill one sick old man in this climate? Having seen their old friend die, he and Le Chisse made make a solemn compact that when one is ill, the other will mount guard over him to prevent any professor of the homicidal science from approaching him. We must do Shaw the justice to say that unlike so many skeptics, his skepticism did not desert him in the moment of danger. Later in the voyage, when ill himself, he flatly refused the surgeon's ministrations. Quote, I excuse myself from putting myself in, the, in his hands on the plea that I had promised my family that I would return to France. <laughs> That's a little bit of dark humor mixed in there. Anyway, the context of these two books stands in stark contrast to the constantly repeated lie that bloodletting was a popular therapy in the 17th century, which is the time period from which those works were derived. Next, with that particularly important component of our bodies, the brain, there are a few things that should be of note in this context. The first comes from Rupert Sheldrake's The Presence of the Past, Morphic Resonance, and the Habits of Nature, published in the UK in 2011. 
first edition published in UK by 19, in 1998 by Collins, and the electronic edition published in the UK in 2011 by Conic Books Ltd. Text copyright 1988 and 2011 Rupert Sheldrake, the authors asserted his moral rights. It states under brain damage and loss of memory. Brain damage can result in the loss of memory in two distinct ways, known as retrograde and anterograde amnesia. Retrograde or backwards amnesia is loss of the ability to remember things that happened before the damage occurred. Anterograde or forwards amnesia is a loss of the ability to remember things that happened afterwards. From the conventional point of view, retrograde amnesias may be due either to destruction of memory traces or to a destruction of the ability to retrieve the memories from the memory store or to a combination of both. By contrast, from the point of view of the hypothesis of formative causation, the potential for past patterns of activity to influence the present by morphic resonance cannot be destroyed. Rather, brain damage affects the ability of the brain to tune into its past patterns of activity. Anterograde amnesia, from the conventional point of view, results from the loss of the ability to form new memory traces. From the point of view of formative causation, it involves the loss of the ability to establish new morphic fields. So essentially, retrograde amnesia has to do with remembering things in the past, and anterograde versus remembering things in the future, or the ability to form memories of the present into the future. And this book is coming from the context that the brain is essentially a processing plant, which is used by the body to process things that exist sort of like a radio tunes into different radio signals, but those radio signals are not contained within the radio mechanism itself. In continuation, the phone known facts can be interpreted from both points of view. The purpose of the present discussion is to show that the effects of brain damage on the loss of memory provide no persuasive evidence in favor of the trace theory. The hypothesis of formative causation fits the facts just as well, if not better. A concussion as a result of sudden blow on the head, a person loses consciousness and becomes paralyzed. The loss of consciousness may last only a few moments or for many days, depending on the severity of the impact. As a person recovers, he may seem normal in most respects, but is unable to recall events before the accident. He has retrograde amnesia. Typically, as his memories return, the first events he can recall are those that occurred longest ago. Memories of more recent events return progressively. In such cases, the amnesia cannot be due to the destruction of memory traces, for the lost memories return. However, the events immediately preceding the blow on the head may never be recalled. There may be a permanent blank period. For example, a motorist may remember approaching the crossroads where the accident occurred, but nothing more. A similar momentary retrograde amnesia also occurs as a result of electroconvulsive therapy administered to mental patients by pa passing a burst of electric current through their heads. Such patients usually cannot remember what happened immediately before the administration of the shock. The generally accepted explanation for such amnesia is that they represent a failure of long-term memories to be established. Events and information in a short-term memory are forgotten because of loss of consciousness, prevents them from being connected up into patterns of relationship that can be remembered. The failure to make such connections, and hence to turn short-term memories into long-term memories, often persists, persists for some time after a concussed patient has recovered consciousness. The anterograde amnesia is also sometimes referred to or described as memorizing defect. People in this condition rapidly forget events as soon as they occur. They may, for instance, forget a meal they have just eaten or news they have just heard. Various memory defects occur as a result of damage to the central cortex caused by strokes, accidental injury, or surgery. Some such as massive lesions of the frontal lobes have general effects on the ability to concentrate and hence affect the formation of fresh memories. Others have quite specific effects on abilities to recognize and recall. The ability to recognize faces, for instance, 
may be lost as a result of a lesion in the secondary visual cortex in the right hemisphere. A sufferer may fail to recognize the faces of his wife and children, although he still knows them by their voices and in other ways. This inability to recognize faces is called prosopagnosia, from the Greek prosopon, face, and agnosis, not knowing, and is one of the many kinds of loss of power to recognize the import of sensory stimuli. Neurologists have described agnosias for colors, sounds, intimate objects, music, words, and so on. They are sometimes described in terms such as mind blindness or word deafness. Neurologists generally attribute this agnosias to disturbances of organized patterns of activity in the brain rather than to a loss of memory traces. The same is true of other disorders such as the aphasias, disorders of language use, due to lesions in various parts of the cortex in the left hemisphere and apraxias, the loss of previously acquired abilities to manipulate objects in a coordinated way. On the present hypothesis, these abilities are lost because the brain damage affects parts of the brain with which the morphic fields are normally associated. If an appropriate pattern of brain activity is no longer present, the fields cannot be tuned into or bring about organizing effects. This interpretation makes it much easier to understand the fact that lost abilities often return. Patients often recover partially or completely from brain damage, even though the damaged regions do not regenerate. The appropriate patterns of activity come into operation somewhere else in the brain. This is almost impossible to understand if programs are hardwired into the nervous system, but fields can move their regions of activity and reorganize themselves in a way that fixed material structures cannot. Such recoveries are reminiscent of the regenerative abilities of plants and animals, and they pose the same kind of problem for mechanistic explanation. In general, after traumatic head injury, memories and skills return at a rapid rate during the first six months, with recoveries sustained at a lower rate for up to 24 months. Defects in sensory, motor, and cognitive functions caused by brain injury due to penetrating wounds are characterized by an enormous resiliency of function in the great majority of cases. That's redundant. Ultimately leading to little or no detectable defect. One of the leading researchers on the long-term effects of brain damage, Hans Tuber, after years of <laughs> that's, that's an ironic name, after years of studying the recovery of wounded veterans of World War II and the Korean and Vietnam Wars, concluded that this far-reaching institution uh, re restitution of functional of function remains, in my view, unexplained. We are far from understanding how the brain is organized, how memory works, or how people recover from brain injuries. The mechanistic interpretations of these phenomena are vague and speculative. Despite decades of intensive research, the hypothesis of formative causation offers a new approach that may turn out to be more fruitful, but at present the question is open. I would probably disagree with that last part. The question isn't really open, it's currently regulated by a very vicious and evil drug cartel that's pretending to be a government aka the DEA, FDA, CIA, and HHS. Now, when we turn to the perspective of the aforementioned white jackets, which likely bear a similar species relation to the yellow jacket, considering both prefer the administration of needles into humans with damaging effect, but some more so than others. Specifically, the white coats can be more damaging than the red or the yellow jackets, and so on and so forth. In one of their articles, written in extremely coded language, under an article labeled ESP-102, a standardized combined extract of Angelica gigas, or gigas, Sorarus chinensis, and Chisandra chinensis significantly improved scopolamine-induced memory impairment in mice. And as I referenced in an earlier video, they see us as lab rats or lab mice. And so naturally, most of these articles and research projects are going to be using mice, but with the lens of human involvement in the future, at least. 
Ed states in the abstract, we assess the effects of oral treatments of ESP-102, a standardized combined extract of Angelica giga, gigas, Sararis shinsensis, shinensis, and Shizandra shinensis on learning and memory deficit. The cognition enhancing effect of ESP-102 was investigated in scopolamine induced 1 mg slash kg body weight amnesiac mice with both passive avoidance and Morris water maze performance tests. Acute oral treatment, single administration prior to scopolamine treatment of mice with ESP-102 doses in the range of 10 to 100 mg uh, kg body weight significantly reduce well that's kilogram but reduce scopolamine induced memory deficits in the passive avoidance performance test. Another noteworthy result included that the fact that prolonged oral daily treatments of mice with much lower amounts of ESP-102 for 10 days reverse scopolamine induced memory deficits. In the Morris water maze performance test both acute and prolonged oral treatments with ESP-102 single administration of 100 mg slash kilogram body weight or prolonged daily administration of 1 and 100 or 1 1 in 10 mg body weight for 10 days respectively significantly ameliorated scopolamine induced memory deficits as indicated by the formation of long term and or short term spatial memory in addition we investigated the effects of ESP-102 on neurotoxicity induced by amyloid beta peptide or glutamate in primary cultured cortical neurons of rats. Pre-treatment of cultures with ESP-102 significantly protected neurons from neurotoxicity induced by either glutamate or abeta 25-35. These results suggest that ESP-102 may have protective characteristics against neuronal cell death and cognitive impairments often observed in Alzheimer's disease stroke ischemic injury and other neurodegenerative diseases. Now notice about this article, they are extracting a particular substance from plants. Those plants naturally contain that substance along with a variety of other things that help in the digestion of those substances. They are extracting that specific substance with the intent of managing health not actually solving the issue of Alzheimer's or any of these cognitive things, but instead to have a substance that they control that you have to go to them for, otherwise you su suffer cognitive decline. And as always, they would likely eradicate this plant from the hands of the public human populace, the so-called natural public, and they would keep it cultivated in their own hands so that they can extract this particular substance that they would then patent and then put into a different variety of drugs with different stupid names. And they would essentially control the ability for people to have cognitive repair when these substances are naturally available in a variety of plants already. And you can cultivate those plants and get the same effect in a much healthier and organic way rather than the awful way that they do it. But either way, they are confirming that cognitive repair is not something that's fictional. That they know that it's something can be done and they would prefer to have all of these different health uh, and learning disorders and all these other mental disorders that they can endlessly treat and that people will blame some nonsensical disorder for something that was actually done to them likely in secret, but more than likely in the open. In another article, Cognitive Ameliorating Effect of Acanthoponax Coreanum Against Scopolamine-Induced Memory Impairment in Mice. So this is using the same induced memory impairment, but a different substance extracted from another plant. It states in the abstract, Acanthoponax Coreanum Nakai Araliacea is one of the most widely cultivated medicinal plants in Heihu or Jeju Island, Korea, and the roots and stem bark of A. coreanum have been traditionally used as tonic agent for general weakness. However, the use of A. coreanum for general weakness observed in the elderly, including those with declined cognitive function, has not been intensely investigated. Well, it hasn't been intensely investigated by them. 
they left off part of that sentence. This study was performed to investigate the effect of the ethanol extract of A. coriandum EEAK on cholinergic blockade-induced memory impairment in mice. To evaluate the ameliorating effects of EEAK against scopolamine-induced memory impairment, mice were orally administered EEAK and several behavioral tasks, including a passive avoidance test, the Y maze, and a novel object recognition task were employed. And allegedly the word novel is new. Besides, Western blot analysis was conducted to examine whether EEAK affected memory associated signaling molecules such as protein kinase B, CA2, and calmodulin or slash calmodulin dependent protein kinase 2 or CAMK2 and CAMP response element binding protein CREB. The administration of EEAK significantly ameliorated the scopolamine-induced cognitive impairment in the passive avoidance task, the Y maze, and the novel object recognition task. The phosphor phosphorylation levels of both AKT and CAMK2 were significantly increased by approximately twofold compared with the control group because of the administration of EEAK. Moreover, the phosphor phosphorylation level of CREB was also significantly increased compared with the control group of the administration of EEAK. The present study suggests that EEAK ameliorates the cognitive dysfunction induced by the cholinergic blockade, in part via several memory associated signaling molecules and may hold therapeutic potential against cognitive dysfunction such as that is presented in neurodegenerative disease, for example Alzheimer's disease and this is copyright 2017 by John Wiley and Sons LTD. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this content, please like this video and share it. Subscribe to my channels and check out any other content that I may have available, which I try to make mostly free, such as my books. Uh, there are free books available at the link. And if you so desire, you may support my work at PayPal or Cash App.